Well, are you ready to hear from the amazing brewer, Dan Carey? I am so excited to have Dan. I, I was at uh, GABF earlier this month, and I was telling someone that Dan was going to be joining us, and they said they just kind of stopped, and they said, whenever I hear Dan Carey is speaking, I listen. So you're in for a real treat because Dan is not only just a great person, but an amazing brewer. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm the host of the Gourmet Brewing Channel, and I'm in Greenville, South Carolina in the USA. And I want to thank everybody for taking time to join us because we really strive to make your day more delicious one sip at a time. Now, Share in the chat if the audio and the video sound and look okay. Uh, it's real hard to tell on this end <laughs> whether my mic's blowing you out or not. So uh, if you just type in there, mic's okay, video's okay, that would be a big help to me. So, uh, and now I want to I want to bring on Dan. Uh, he's not going to get a chance to talk yet, but uh, I'm anxious to. Bring him on the screen so you know he's there. Uh, and we'll be starting with him in just a minute. So uh, please consider writing in the chat, not only about the audio and the video. Thank you, Volker. I say all, all's okay. Write to Dan and let him know how much you appreciate him taking time away from his wife and family. And I think a, a dog walk is in store a little while from now. And he's postponing that to join us today. So please uh, let Dan know how much you appreciate him taking the time. So, hey, Merlinius, Mike's okay. Good. Video's okay. Great. So let me tell you about Dan. Dan is the co-founder and diploma master brewer at New Glarus Brewery. He's been in the brewing industry since age 20 and holds a bachelor's degree in food science from UC Davis, specializing in malting and brewing science. He honed his skills with an apprenticeship in Germany, and he's operated and constructed multiple breweries across the U.S., and including, I think, Sierra Nevada. I've heard some stories there. So he was previously serving as a production supervisor for, Anhe for Anheuser-Busch. He is a decorated brewer, and Dan has won several prestigious awards, including the Association of Brewers Small Brewer of the Year in 2003, Mid-Sized Brewer of the Year in 2005 and 2006, the Russell Shearer Award for Innovation and in Craft Brewing in 2006. And Dan, I, this is just one, a stellar bio. We'll bring you back on screen in just a moment. So I also want to let you, a lot of first timers are here because this is a, just a great chance to uh, get to speak to master brewers, subject matter ex experts. And we do these monthly. This is actually the 96th free event, thanks to monthly supporters via Patreon. And I want to thank those monthly supporters because they contribute to these programs. And there's supposed to be a green button on the screen. I'll, I'll do that in a minute. But if you want to uh, consider joining Patreon, you can click there to learn more information. Gourmet Brewing is a community-funded channel, and that's the only way we can do it is through the generosity of so many of you through the crowdfunding site. And a, a lot of you do some spot contributions, and that helps. Uh, when you sign up, you can not pay anything or throw in a, enough I could go buy a beer, whatever. Uh, and I appreciate those folks. Supporters include the, get the audio files, behind the scenes, brewery tour, tours, and it includes full length interviews with people like Ken Grossman and John Mallett. So uh, give that a consideration. And since that link is not showing up, and that's pretty, pretty important for the continuation of this, I'm going to pop that in the chat there. So. Don't mean to sound too much like a commercial, but it is it is important. Uh, also, I am trying to grow my YouTube channel because I've learned kind of the hard way that guests kind of size me up depending on the size of my YouTube channel. So if you get a chance to subscribe or look or give a thumbs up, that would be a big help because most of these are on there 
along with a lot of other programs. I just came back from GABF, did about a dozen interviews there. Peter Buchart, uh, Randy Mosher, a long list of just great people. And those are going to be up on the YouTube channel. So check them out. Uh, for those uh, also that might be viewing the stream on YouTube or uh, Facebook or uh, LinkedIn, you know, we're glad you're there and join us on Crowdcast if you want to submit questions. Uh, also consider clicking on the follow button. It's in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Well, no, it's center of your screen. They moved it. This is new software. Uh, so click up there in the center and you get notifications of when I go live. Um, and let's see, I also do virtual speaking, private virtual tastings and live events. So let me know if I can help you now coming up, uh, for AHA, I'm involved in Betsy Lay is going to be doing a presentation this month and the amazing brewer, Ben, excuse me, Ben Edmonds is going to be in November. Ben is amazing. He was the captain of one of my judging tables at GABF, and he is just a phenomenal brewer. Uh, and we're going to have a Zoom after party. Uh, I'll put the link there, but we won't go live until this is over with, which is going to be a while from now. So, But we will be there. Dan may make it, may not. Kind of depends on how late we go. So we'll uh, we'll see how that goes. Now, let's get started. I'm ready to kind of quit going through all the logistics. Well, that was the wrong button. And I promise you, this won't be the last time I hit the wrong button because I have had a hard time learning this new software. Ha! There it is. Uh, Dan, thank you for joining us today. And be sure to unmute your mic. I'm not sure it is unmuted yet. There we go. So, you and I have talked, we had an hour-long interview uh, where we talked about yeast sleuthing, I would call it. I don't know, it's kind of, you guys sounded like Raiders of the Lost Ark, except it, that it was for yeasts. So I've, I've got a question for you. The German purity laws, I mean, since we're going to be diving into history, what, what exactly, how would you def say Rhein Heiskabolt? and loggers have to do with each other? I mean, where, what is that relationship? Well, you know, the, the laws uh, around how beer is to be brewed go back in Bavaria, go back even before the Rhein High School boat of 15, 16. But in general, they're, other than collecting taxes, they're all about the uh, purity of beer. And so one of the ideas was that beer had to be brewed, lager beer had to be brewed in the wintertime because in those days, beer brewed in the summertime spoiled often. So uh, the, uh, um, the, the the government was trying to force brewers to make beer only in the wintertime. And uh, this, uh, this coupled with the Little Ice Age, which was a period of extreme cold weather in Europe, uh in about 1300 to 18, 1800 uh that there was a, then a selecting a natural selection for yeast that was uh, more capable of fermenting at cold temperatures so lager lager beer probably would not have come about uh if it uh, or become as popular as it is if it wasn't for the little ice age and for the laws that required brewers to brew only in the winter time well, that's interesting. I knew you would have a, a different perspective. I've never heard the Little Ice Age associated with it, but that actually is very insightful. That 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 makes sense, that it wasn't just sticking barrels in caves and, wow, well, that just happened. Well, you know, the, the weather was cold, and, uh, I, uh, I you know, obviously brewing in the heat of summer uh, meant that beer was prone to, to souring. Uh, so... Uh, uh, Brewing in caves with ice, you had to have ice available. So um, uh, I think it kind of all just was a perfect storm of events. You know, in England, of course, they experienced also the Little Ice Age, but they didn't have nearly as much ice. So you read in the old literature that uh, brewers in England basically used a really high hopping rate to stabilize, stabilize against bacteria, against lactobacillus souring, whereas the continental brewers 
they opt because they had ice, they opted for using ice to stabilize their beer. So you can either ferment really cold or you can have an extremely high hop rate. And in those days, English beer IPAs of the day had really high hop rates. And people wrote about the cost of high hopping versus the cost of ice, which was more economical. That was a debate. Well, and it's speaking of that. So what is the difference? How, how would you define as a master brewer the difference between an ale and a lager? It's not just the yeast, is it? <clears throat> well, that's, uh, that's kind of a, a rabbit hole, a uh, big question. But I guess you, I could start by saying what the difference is not. The difference is not about, uh, about flavor. It's not about one being fruity and one not being fruity. It's not about color. Certainly, you can have amber and dark lager beers, and you can have golden ales. Uh, of course, lager is a German word. It means to store or to age. So historically, lager beers were, that, uh, were beers that went through an extended period of cold aging um, as part of their process. And ales, on the other hand, were not, uh, did not go through a, a cold uh, period, um, although that's, you know, there's, there's certainly always exceptions to the rules. And uh, normally ales are thought of as top fermented yeast and lagers are bottom fermented yeast. But again, there's nowadays there's more exceptions to the rule than they are that adhere to the rule. Well, and, and I run into this a lot, speaking of that. So a lot of people just seem to say Pilsner instead of beer. And, and I don't know that they always mean what a master brewer understands a Pilsner because that's a pretty defined thing. So how would you... How would you define the difference between a lager and a pilsner? That's a, again, it depends on who you talk to, but the way, what you're interested in, what I, what I would say. So certainly a pilsner is a type of lager. I mentioned that lagers can be any color, any strength, any flavor. So lagers can be things like Bach beers and Meritzen's, uh, Fest beers, uh, pale Bach beers, et cetera, et cetera. So a pilsner is a type of, of lager beer and it's named after the town of Pilsen where it was invented. Pilsen is in Bohemia. So uh, a beer or a person or anything from the town of Pilsen in the German language would be a Pilsner. So a beer from the town of Pilsen is called a Pilsner, just like uh, a beer from the town of Budweis, uh, which is also the German name of a Bohemian town is, is a Budweiser beer. Um, so, uh, but, but over time, you know, a lager, a Pilsners were invented in 1842 and have pretty much taken over the world. I would imagine 90% plus, uh, beers in the world are, are of this golden style beer, but now there are many, many subcategories. So when we think of, when I think of a Pilsner beer, I'm thinking of the beer mainly, um, uh, Pilsner Urquell. And if you're in Czech Republic, a Pilsner means Pilsner Urquell. In Germany, you also have Pils beer. Uh, a, a agreement was made in court that uh, Germans would not call their beer Pilsners. They call them Pils. Uh, then you come to America or some of the more new world countries, you have a modern uh, American style Pilsner that's usually made with adjuncts, which is a uh, golden, uh, pale in color, but has over the years uh, somewhat drifted apart from the original uh, style of beer from, uh, from the city of, uh, of Pilsen. But if you're in Czech Republic and you order a, a Pilsner, you're going to get a Pilsner Urquell. That's for sure. They, they, you know, so, so in Czech Republic, a lager beer would be what we would call a Pilsner and hence the confusion. Well, I think it's a, it's a fun thing because there's a lot of history, but interesting history of, behind both of them. And that's kind of where I'd like to take our conversation next, because there's a tendency to think, you know, when people were brewing and they made stuff out of wood and they were brewing with, you know, even brewed with rocks. Yes. I think there's a yeah. tendency to look at that as primitive and that they weren't uh, as, as bright as modern day brewers. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you agree with that? How did, how did lager <laughs> yeasts? get created by these maybe primitive people? Uh, they, they were far from primitive. Uh, actually, um, uh, a famous uh, barley breeder, uh, Harry Harlan, in his book, uh, My Life with, uh, I think it's called My Life with Barley, uh, he, he 
argues that the people, uh, our, our predecessors, our ancestors were actually smarter than we are because they um, were able to domesticate uh, wheat and rye and corn and, uh, and horses and cows and ducks and chickens um, and things like not zebras. Uh, so, so this work was done thousands and thousands of years ago by people that figured out what to eat and what could be crossbred and, and how to how to take a grass and turn it into something to turn bread and beer into. So in a lot of ways, these people were probably more clever. They didn't have the Internet. They didn't have uh, universities. They just did it uh, by simple observation. So I would argue that these people were far from primitive. They were probably a lot more capable than the modern person is. But but I guess to, to get into to answer your question, where did lager yeast come from? Lager yeast is a is a relatively new thing. It's been around for um, you know some hundreds of years, may, maybe five hundred uh, years or so. It's a hybrid of two yeasts. It's a hybrid of ale yeast uh, and um, a a wild yeast called Saccharomyces uh, ubionis that is a very cold tolerant. Um, yeast and it was a fortuitous uh, hybridization that happened uh, at least at least once and probably many times in breweries. Lager beer has been around since um, probably the 1400s or the 1500s or, or maybe long before that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, before Carlsberg did their work in the 1880s, all yeast was a blend of uh, of yeast. It wasn't a single culture. So there was no pure yeast. It was a, um, a blend uh, of, of all kinds of different microorganisms. And certainly that would have uh, led to complexity of beer because lots of different microorganisms working together. And, and that, was, uh, that was maybe lost uh, with the work in Carlsberg when the single, uh, single cell propagation uh, was was designed and, uh, and and taught around the world and became the standard because it's, it's much easier to make a consistent beer that's less prone to infection. But maybe we've lost some complexity because of that. But in any event, what I want to say is these two, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharomyces ubionis, they may have worked in conjunction in lager breweries, um, 500 years ago, they might have worked in tandem or they might have hybridized uh, at some point. But uh, for sure, it's believed, uh, well, the theory uh, from researchers in, in Belgium and in, in, in Vine Stefan is that the uh, hybridization that, that we, the yeast that we use today is a hybridization of these two strains that happened uh, most likely at the Hofboy House in Munich, probably. Um, in the early 1600s. Wow. So, so essentially, is it because, you know, we tried to eliminate all these wild yeasts and we had to do that through science and separating and cloning and, or the duplicating the yeast, but did the cold in effect create I guess you would call that a self-selection because the yes. only ones that could survive would logger and everything else was kill killed off purely because of the cold. Yeah. I don't know if they were killed off, but yes. And, and you, you are hundred percent correct that the, um, it, it, it was selected, you know, and just a natural selection that the, the yeast and bacteria lactobacillus, they lactobacillus and ale yeast prefer to operate at blood temperature at room temperature or our body temperature, whereas lager yeast, because of the ubionis strain, uh, are very, very capable of, of um, fermenting even down to freezing temperature. So that certainly, if you made beer in a in a cave with ice, uh, and the, and the you know if you're fermenting at say 40 degrees Fahrenheit down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, that this these were capable of fermenting, and the brewers noticed this and they kept selecting that way keep kept pulling the sediment the i think the germans call it um zoig or stuff that settles to the bottom of the tank they didn't know it was yeast but they knew that they needed this stuff to make beer so i had the privilege of spending the day with frank bone about 18 months ago and as you know when he he doesn't pitch any yeast he just right. 
he's got a big shallow pan and he's got fans and he takes the night air and blows it across there from the Seen Valley. So yes. his his yeast and other critters, <laughs> I guess, are are found in nature. I mean, it's in his literally in his backyard. But you can't do that with lager yeast, right? I mean, you, you're not going to go into Bavaria and open up the window and get a lager yeast. Can you find it anywhere, anywhere like that? Uh, you could say that lager yeast is a domesticated uh, fungus, just like uh, a Holstein cow is not going to mostly not survive in the wild. And uh, the yeast that we use today we definitely have a synergistic relationship with them um, that uh, we're, we're basically keepers of the yeast. And, you know, one could argue that maybe the yeast are really in charge because we brewers, we build our lives, we build our machinery around how to facilitate them and how to keep the yeast happy. But certainly finding lager yeast in the wild would be impossible because they developed in the brewery. I, I believe, I believe uh, certainly nobody knows for sure, but uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast is generally believed to be associated with, um, with oak, uh, with, with trees. And the Ubiana strain that, that is the mate to the cerevisiae uh, is definitely uh, found in oak trees in places like uh, Patagonia, uh, in China, New Zealand, and North America, and now even in Ireland. But unfortunately, it hasn't been found in Europe. So uh, that's uh, kind of a problem with the whole theor theory that these two yeasts came from wood. But the idea is, is that the old growth oak forests are mainly gone uh, in Germany. There's none, hardly any left. So, you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is not a common thing that you find in the environment. Uh, it's something that um, it's, on, it's, it's in grapes, it's on grapes. Um, but it's not, you would not open the windows. And if you open the windows, you would have like a spontaneously fermented lambic beer. But you're actually putting some time and probably, I guess, your finances into help finding maybe the origins of the lager yeast. Aren't you working with Weinstefaner and uh, what, Matthias Hutzler and doing yep. some real research? What do you hope to gain from that? Let's let's say he goes and finds it in a tree in, in England, which answers a question that you were searching for, but so what? You find it in a tree in England, now you've got it. What does that mean for us in the beers going forward? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say that um, part of moving forward into the future it's to understand where we came from. And that's why people are studying the Big Bang, for example, where, where did we come from? And uh, so to really understand the history of lager yeast is important uh, for a few reasons. One is number one, uh, scientists uh, pursue knowledge simply because they're passionate, but the people that fund this work don't don't do it because they're passionate. They hope to get something from it. We are at a, a unique time in the brewing industry because a lot of work is being done on yeast uh, to try to understand how to how to extract more flavors, different flavors, no um, novel flavors out of yeast. And if if we think of lager brewing, you know. 200, 300, 500 years ago, if we think about these mixed cultures and all of this was lost at the pinch point because the only lager yeast that survived to the modern time, it, it came, it, it, the theory goes, it came from uh, the Hofbräu House, the Ho Hofbräu House in Munich. It went uh, with uh, Gabriel Settelmeyer to his new brewery the Spaten Brewery in Munich. And from there, he gave it to Carlsberg and Carlsberg selected pure yeast cultures, the, the most um, good, well-fermenting, most balanced flavor, most well-behaved yeast. And then that became the standard from all lager yeast. So if you imagine all of these yeast 
were lost because only one made it into the modern age after 1883. That's why all lager yeasts are relatively the same. The, the amount we've only had, you know, 140 years of time for mutation and change. So um, uh, other than understanding the history for the sake of history, if we understand where our yeast comes from, maybe we can use some of those strains that are found to generate, to try to recreate some of those flavors that may have existed before the pinch point of 1883, when the single, uh, single, single cell system was really uh, adopted mostly around the world. So, so you're hoping there's a new deli deliciousness that may oh, be lost. Definitely. That is definitely what uh, Matthias Hussler is is working on to try to, um, I mean, okay, certainly there's a lot of uh, uh, yeast um, uh, vendors and uh, yeast scientists in the United States looking at using CRISPR to develop uh, various attributes, but um, he, he's trying to understand where we came from and by finding, uh, maybe finding yeast in old breweries, whereas mainly what he looks for is going to old breweries, to old malt houses, and swabbing old equipment and old floors with the hope of finding novel yeast that uh, maybe were lost with the advent of uh, modern matter brewing. Well, because you have to that admit that most of the lager lager yeast that are used today, there are differences, but they're much much more the same than they are different. Well, you and I and uh, Matthias had a great discussion on that earlier this year, and I'm going to post it to YouTube shortly. So uh, look for it on my channel because it's a great discussion, and Matthias really dives into this in great detail. Well, we're speaking of diving in, Dan, I'm ready for a beer. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's not a new Glarus, uh, but I'd like to play a short video. Uh, I did an interview with... Uh, the two brewers who developed this Oktoberfest beer at Sierra Nevada, uh, Scott Jennings and Ollie, I don't know that I can pronounce Ollie's last Weiss, name. Weiss uh, thank you. Weiss yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to play that short clip while I pour mine right quick. And then Dan, I'd be interested in your comments uh, about what, uh, what those two guys talk about. So, All right, I'm going to open my beer while, while we're listening. All right, here we go. Let me know if the audio is okay. It's quite pale, but not, not as, as light in color as many of the modern fest beers. It does have a little bit of a, a deeper oh, golden cool. to it. Uh, some of the modern fest beers yep. are very pale in color and uh, very uh, uh, low in, in hop character. So... Since neither of us, I don't think, make anything that's low in hop character, <laughs> we wanted to uh, to really uh, uh, put a lot of hops in it. So we got Cascade hops in there. This is a non-traditional hop for a fest beer, but uh, that's very important to the character of Sierra Nevada. So, so we have some Cascade in there. We've got some, uh, I would say, traditional German noble uh, hop varieties in it, which are very traditional. But then uh, for a little uh, Caravitter yeah. flair, maybe we have some Ariana, uh, which is, I don't know, a, a more recent uh, uh, yeah. interesting aroma hop from Germany that uh, gives a nice somewhere between yeah. citrus and, and berry uh, character. So. All right, so I've got mine poured, and then let's see if we can't get you on screen. Most important person. Oops, I did it again. <laughs> let's get rid of that one. That's a really nice go. looking. That's a good looking picture of you right there. That looks like maybe you're uh, like like you're when you were in college or something, or like you look like <laughs> your football picture or something. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. I used to used to have brown hair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I feel your pain. Yeah, <laughs> but at least I got the hair. So I, yeah, it can be true. any color it wants, right? As long that's as it right. hangs on. That's right. That's right. Oh, <laughs> uh, this is an interesting beer. Now, most of you know if you happen to look at it. I was hoping to get Summerfest, 
and uh, Summerfest was impossible to get, so I found out. Uh, so I switched over to the Oktoberfest, which is a, a interesting, it is a, I would think, a very non-traditional fest beer, but I will have to say I kind of like it. But what do you think about some of the comments uh, that Scott and Ollie were talking about? Well, it's really interesting to me because uh, Ollie has a brewery in, in Hamburg, and he's a uh, he's a well-regarded beer sommelier, and uh, he's a well-known brewer around the world. And he's he's been a fan of Sierra Nevada for many many years. So I'm glad that they're working together. And of course, Scott is a is a great brewer in his own right and a, and a real gentleman. So they're both really sweet guys. Uh, and anything that Sierra Nevada makes is. Uh, it's always great beer, always has great foam. And um, one thing that, uh, that that Scott was talking about was Ariana hops. And Ariana hops were, are, are a, a, a modern um, holler towel, what are called flavor hops. Uh, it's, it's a little bit higher in alpha than you would think for a traditional aroma hop, but it's very fruit forward. Um, bred at the Hull Institute for to, to kind of compete against the uh, the assertively uh, flavored American hops. But Ariana was actually named for Eric Toft. Yeah, I, I think you guys know Eric Toft from the Shone Round Brewery. He's originally from Wyoming, but he's he's he, he's brewmaster at the Shone Round Brewery near Salzburg. Very, very well-regarded uh, brewery making beautiful Hellas and Pills beer. But his wife's name is Ariana. And so th that hop was named uh, after her. And uh, this beer is a fest beer, um, but, it, you know, in, in typical uh, Sierra Nevada Ollie fashion, they push the envelope and uh, uh, kind of modernize it because, um, you know, I was just in, in, uh, in Munich for a hop selection, so I, I drank my share of fest beers. And uh, this is a great beer, but it's, uh, it's, it's certainly more assertive. It's certainly more bitter. And uh, that was... Um, I think I'm sure that was their intent because they're both modern adventurous brewers. Well, and I, I did ask, try and get on the screen. I am, I'm not doing real well with this. Okay. Get rid of that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, I asked Scott and we have kind of a private joke because I've asked him way too many times about the yeast, but he did say this is Vine Stefaner's 3470 in this. Now, you know, that is that is like the world's most popular lager yeast. Is that right? <laughs> oh, yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. It's and what uh, was the I, origins of the number. You have any idea, Dan? Uh, Dan? Sure. Uh, so, so the yeast are given numbers when they're put into banks. And uh, this yeast, 34, uh, came from the, the Hassenbräu uh, brewery in Augsburg, Germany. And it, it probably went to Weinstefan. And um, my mentor, uh, the, the person that I've learned more about brewing than anybody in the world and a, and a true friend who uh, recently passed away, Ludwig Narcis, in 1956, he wrote his dissertation for his PhD uh, on lager yeast and selected this this strain 34, uh, which was just a random number, it means nothing than, other than that was the number they gave it when it arrived at the bank, was the best yeast of all the lager yeast that he tried because it, it had the best flocculation characteristics, well-balanced, uh, well-behaved. It uh, produced relatively low um, uh, diacetyl. It produced a uh, pleasing level of, um, of esters. Uh, it, it produced a, a good pH. It produced the low levels of of, um, of higher alcohols. So it was an all around really good yeast. And so uh, that's what he recommended in his PhD study. And then in 1970, he went back to it and said, you know, this this 34 is mutating and it's losing its well behaved flocculation characteristics. So he he made uh, in 1970. He did a lot of work where he repeatedly selected this yeast to try to get a more flocculent version of it and then released it as a variant of 34 in 1970, hence the name 3470. He did it again, I think, in 78. And there's another strain, 3478. But 3470 is just a really well-behaved, 
uh, yeast that 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 is predictable and uh, you know brewing's hard. So if you have a yeast that just tastes nice and ferments well and is well behaved, and I think that's why thirty four seventy is uh, so popular. Well, it certainly comes up a lot, and uh, uh, so and, and Andrew mentions twenty four seventy. What what is twenty four seventy? Oh, he said uh, 30, sorry. <laughs> okay. Never mind. Correction. Correction. So as as we move on, because I want to talk about spotted cow, even though I haven't had one, I'm a Saison fan. I, I see Drew Beecham in there and I know Drew loves them too. And and I feel really bad that I haven't had a spotted cow, but we Well, we Doug, I would have, have to a, send some to you. Yeah. Well, I would to. I'll take you up on that in a heartbeat. Right. Uh so, but I want, before we wrap up, so how would you summarize the story I heard when I was studying for my Cicerone was that, you know, people were brewing and they were fermenting in caves and because they stayed in the caves and the caves were cold, the, the lager yeast kind of happened. Yes. But you added quite a bit of color to that story with more things. So how would you summarize it if someone were to ask and say, Okay, if you can't find lager yeast in the wild, how did it occur? Well, spotted cow is an ale. It's a golden ale. Uh, I know that people call it a cream ale, but I've never, never said that. I've, it's it's not, not how I view it. Uh, I view it, I call it a farmhouse ale. And people don't like that term because when they think of farmhouse ales, they think of DuPont, they think of Saisons. This is not a Saison. It's not a Belgian beer. Where it comes from is um, there's an open air museum in Wisconsin, an Eagle, Wisconsin, uh, that um, called Old World Wisconsin. And it's a bunch of old farmsteads that were moved to this large plot of land. And there's basically a living museum. So there's different homesteads and they're, 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 they're working farms. And so if you go there on the weekend and you can walk through many, many acres and visit these farms. And there's a, there's a Germanic farm that represents more or less what... Um, a uh, immigrant would have had in say the 1850s or 1860s and so you go to this house and there's people dressed in period clothes and they're cooking and in their root cellar they had a crock pot of beer fermenting and i thought oh that's really interesting so here we are in a german farm in wisconsin in the 1840s or 50s what would people have brewed i imagine in those days well certainly uh on a farm they, uh, they in a crock pot in a root cellar it whatever, 55, 65 degrees Fahrenheit, they, they would not have been making lager. They would have been making ale. So, okay. Uh, and I imagine that if they were an affluent farmer and it was unfiltered, and if they were affluent farmers, they maybe they would be using um, uh, really nice uh, sauce hops from Czech Republic. And uh, the, the pale beers of Pilsen were coming into vogue at that time. There was a better understanding of kilning. So I just imagine that maybe somebody with the rudimentary skills would have made a beer, a rustic beer like Spotty Cow, an unfiltered golden ale made with top fermented yeast um, and uh, in a, at a farmhouse, hence the name um, Farmhouse Ale. Well, <clears throat> I think... You know, I'm really doing terrible with this now, and and I've really just barely. Had you just want us to see your good looking picture. <laughs> uh, well, I guess it's happening whether I want it to or not. Well, uh, well, I love a saison, and since I couldn't get a spotted cow, but I like to have kind of a theme going on. Uh, I got a tank seven. And I've got a short video on it. It was an interview that I did with Stephen Powell's uh, almost two years ago, maybe a little more than two years ago. I haven't posted it on YouTube, but I will because it was a fun interview. But I've got about a minute and a half of it where he talks about the yeast and the hops and his spotted cow. And then when we get done with it, Dan, besides drinking our uh, Tank 7, I would love to hear your comments because... It sounds like your spotted cow saison is pretty traditional, uh, maybe in the same realm of the traditionality that uh, might be in a, a saison Dupont. 
versus Tank 7, which I think is kind of the other end of the spectrum. And I'd love to get your comments on it. So I will play that uh, short video right quick. And again, let me know if the audio and the video are okay. Don't pour it too crazy because it's going to foam up on you. Uh, just pour it nice and easy and then put your glass straight and then keep pouring and it'll have, you'll have a nice head. So the beer is a little bit orangey also, and that's um, our pale malt, our spec and our pale malt is a little higher in color than uh, most pale malts are. That's just because um, that's the way we, we, the pale malt that we buy. And uh, it gives a little color to our wheat beer. It gives a little color to most of our uh, paler beers. And it should be, it should be pretty effervescent. Uh, you should see little bubbles coming through. This beer should have about a uh, three, three and a half volumes of CO2. Uh, the first thing I always notice is, is the hop, it, even though it's not crazy hoppy, uh, it's this, uh, the hop character always comes through to me. For yeast, because I haven't talked about yeast yet, and uh, don't kill me for this one, but we don't use a saison yeast. Uh, I'm not a big fan of saison yeast. They, uh, a lot of them are just too phenolic for me. Uh, they're just a little bit too much out of balance. And uh, we've used Saison de Pont yeast in the past, and it's a, it's a fantastic yeast, but creating that flavor profile that they make is extremely difficult to do, uh, just because of the dimensions that, of tanks that they have compared to what regular silicon colical tanks do. So we use a, um, we use a Belgian Abbey strain for this beer, uh, which to me creates a nicer balance between the spicy phenolics and the, and the fruitiness. And um, that's just what I like about this beer. Um, we use this yeast also for uh, quite a few other beers that we make. We used it in our uh, six class, which is quadruple. We used it in our triple that we used to make. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things as professional brewers, the things that we do, we try to make as many beers as we possibly can with one yeast strain uh, and don't make, ourselves, make our lives just overcomplicated. Well, there's mine, and let's see if we can bring, bring Dan on successfully the first shot. <laughs> ah, this is getting bad. All right. Well, through the process of elimination, <laughs> I got to figure this out. Anyway, it is it is a new interface, and my, my apologies. Uh, Tank Seven is just a fabulous beer, but I'm not sure it's exactly representative of a a farmhouse uh, saison. Is it? Uh, I, I think it's a great beer. It's obviously made for drinking. Uh, that's a drinking beer right there. Uh, it's balanced because it's, it's it's malty and sweet, but there's enough hop bitterness and yeast character uh, to make it interesting. Uh, um, and Yes, Stephen's a great brewer, and of course he, he's from Belgium, so um, he's. Uh, I would say it's a legit saison beer because he says it is. You know, we Americans, when we think of saison, we think of um, uh, we think of um, saison Dupont, but that's only one beer. If you talk to uh, someone like uh, Yvonne de Beretz from uh, Brewery de la Seine in Brussels. Uh, he also makes a Saison beer, but it's more, in, in my opinion, not, not his words, it's more akin to like a Lambic beer with a higher hopping rate. Um, uh, a Saison doesn't really have to do with using the du uh, DuPont strain. There is really no true Saison yeast. Saison, of course, means seasons, a seasonal beer. Um, and uh, <laughs> it appears to me in the true Belgian style, it's can be whatever you want it to be. Um, so I would say that this is, in my opinion, it's within the, the realm of what a Saison should be. And Saison DuPont is a wonderful world-class great beer, but it's not the only one. And a couple of things that Stephen brought up that I found really interesting was they're using a little bit darker uh, malt than their traditional pale lager malt, they, they're ordering their malt with a little bit more color, and that's 
probably because they're trying to get more flavor out of it because the flavor comes from kilning. And there's a lot of other advantages to using uh, as well as some negatives and using a, a darker malt, but maybe it's more cross between a Pils and a Vienna malt. Uh, but his comments about the phenols, you know, phenolics are pretty much a love hate thing. Some people uh, appreciate phenols, but uh, it's been bred out of most yeast, selected out of most yeast because most people don't like the taste of phenols. They can be, they can be uh, hard. They can be, uh, they, when you have lots of bitterness and lots of alcohol, they can clash. Um, and it's, some people say it tastes like toothpaste. Uh, so um, I think that it makes sense that he would select a yeast that's not throwing a lot of phenols. And it seems like a lot of these uh, yeasts that are used in Belgium that are used for these types of beers, when they're used in America, oftentimes the beers throw a lot more phenols. And Stephen was talking about uh, the, the height of the tanks being a difference. And um, I, I wonder also if American malt, uh, you know, the, the spectrum of protein that we have in our malt may be different and that might be affecting it too. So I think it was a good move because this is a winner. I think um, the public has uh, voted and uh, Stephen wins. I bet he sells a lot more of this than some of his Belgian uh, competitors do in the United States. That's <laughs> certainly true of me. It's, it's one of my favorites. Again, I hadn't had spotted cow yet, but I can't wait to, to try. But spotted it. cow is very different than this. It's, 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 it's yeah. maybe it's, it's hazier, a little bit lighter in color, uh, less bitter, and it's more fruity, much more fruit forward. And a little bit of a tart twang to it. Well, is, is it true that it's kind of the Wisconsin state beer? Well, you know, no, it appears so. It appears. So. Um, I think I was uh, saw a sign at a UW Madison, the University of Wisconsin Madison football game, and uh, they were playing um, a team from Minnesota, and, and you know Minnesota and, and Illinois are a big competition, just like North and South California. But there was someone who was carrying a big sign that said something like, uh, "There was the Wisconsin, the, the Wisconsin, the Badgers suck, and Spotted Cow is just okay." So I thought that was a, just a crack up. But when you think of Wisconsin, you think of cheese curds and the Green Bay Packers and Spotted Cow. Well, I mean, there's stories that I've read. It's almost like Smokey and the Bandit back when they were getting uh, Coors beer brought over to the East Coast. Uh, I, I've heard similar stories of sure. trades for, I mean, they, they, it's almost like currency. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd like to live in a world where we barter with beer rather than cash. Well, let's talk about the, the yeast that's in that. Did you, you know, how did you select the yeast in Spotted Cow, recognizing you were trying to focus on farmhouse? And uh, I, I, I said it was a German. This. It was a German homestead, so we used a coal yeast from Vine Stefan, top fermenting coal yeast. So yeast from okay. Cologne. Which incidentally, you could argue, you know, we were talking about the difference between ales and lagers. Uh, the beers of Cologne are often called top fermented lager beers because they're made with top fermented yeast, but they go through a long lagering phase. So that's why I hesitate to really try to describe the difference between ales and lagers, because if a top fermented beer goes through a long lagering phase like they do in Cologne or traditionally or uh, like they do in Dusseldorf, that would be... Um, a top for a minute lager beer. So for those of us that want to try and mimic or clone uh, like a Saison DuPont, and, and I've been, I've crawled all through their brewery and uh, Olivier Dedica was nice enough to put up with me and my camera uh, right huh. during the, the height of COVID. Uh, but we were going through that and it is, it's a very shallow, very small tank. It's not very big. Yes. It's, and very warm. Yeah. Very warm. Very warm. Yeah. But if we wanted to clone, brew a clone of that beer in the U.S., would you suggest not using the the DuPont yeast because of its finickiness? Oh, no. I think if you want to clone uh, a, a – uh, I've never made a clone of Cezanne DuPont, so I, I can only 
speculate on what one would do, but certainly um, yeast matters. So I would make a wort um, and then break that wort into three or four different small batches and try some different yeast and see what works for you. Because the uh, frustrating thing about beer is what works for one person may not work for another. But uh, from what the little that I know about the Saison DuPont yeast is it needs to stay warm, meaning, uh, you know, 30 degrees. So what's that, uh, you, you know, in, in the high 70s, 80, 80, 80 degrees. So it's a warm fermentation. But I, I'm, I'm sorry, Doug, I'm, I'm not really, uh, I've never really brewed that style of beer. So um, I can't well, really Well, no, speak. but you're, you're kind of an American Saison expert and you know, with the, the farmhouse and, and I, and I thought your comment was interesting that just because you get a Saison European Saison yeast doesn't mean you're going to get the same characteristics here in the U S because of, you were saying maybe the malt or other characteristics that just don't all come together quite like they did in Europe. That's definitely true. The malt is, the malt is definitely different for sure. That has a huge impact. Okay, so you brew your saison with a Colch yeast. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I never said it's a saison. It's a uh, we, you know we don't. I'm not much of a category guy. I think when you when when you probably you find when you talk to professional brewers, they're uh, they they shy away from categories because uh, we don't like to be pigeonholed into um, uh, you know saying that this is this style or that style. It's spotted cow. I, I would say is, is definitely not a saison. Uh, it, it, it's it's because I use the term farmhouse ale. It does not mean saison because it's not a Belgian farmhouse. It's a Wisconsin farmhouse that I saw this. So um, uh, you know, on one hand, you're right because it's our our beer, so we can call it whatever we want. But I would not. I would be hesitant to give the impression that it's similar to uh tank seven or even dupont it's it's unique okay well I, I usually get my butt handed to me peter bucart did it at gabf when i asked him what his what styles were selling the best in his uh, purpose brewery <laughs> yeah he is uh that's a button if you ask ask uh peter bucart <laughs> well, I about found styles. Out. <laughs> yeah but he was very kind he was very kind in how he put it well but what i was getting at uh, a farmhouse with a cold yeast is not intuitive to some people, at least me. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about uh, your Adel Pills. What, how would you, uh, that's a cool beer. I think you just celebrated, what, 30th, 30 years yeah. with it or something? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, what, what kind of yeast is in there? Uh, okay, so... Uh, we, we've in our in our 30 years, we've made well in excess, like like a lot of craft brewers, we've made well in excess of 200 beers. And it, it, the, the beers that become popular are chosen by our customers. And the reason why Spotted Cow was selected, chosen, is because people continued to buy it. And so we brewed it again. So uh, it, it's it's not anything that we're selecting. We make we make 200 beers with as much love and passion as we can in each case. And then the customers decide what they want. Uh, but Spotted Cow came some years after we had we had opened. We started uh, our first beer was a lager beer called Edel Pills. And Edel Pills means, a, you know, basically noble or true Pilsner. But really what inspired uh, and it's a lager beer made with 3470 yeast originally it was made with a yeast from domens um uh called uh called a 320 um which is more or less this nearly the same as 3470 um but um when i was an apprentice brewer in germany uh deb and i had tasted uh budvar budweiser from Cheske Bujovice with the original Budweiser, which is court, court of, sort of almost like a Hellas. Uh, it's much less bitter than Pilsner Urquell, but we, we just love that beer. Drinking it fresh on draft, it, it was an epiphany for us. And so when we started the brewery, we wanted to make a 
beer in that style, meaning a beer that was a little bit darker than, say, uh, you know, your typical uh, German style um, Helles beer, um, but in that style, uh, not too bitter. And um, so we, we brewed this beer and this was our first one that we made in 1993. We only sold it on draft and it was our number one selling beer for some years. But, you know, as the craft brewing business grew, craft brew customers, again, they're the ones who are in charge. They wanted ales and lager beer, particularly pale lager beer was, um, you know, this was the days when Sam Adams beer was really big. And uh, Sam Adams is sort of an amber uh, beer, a, you know, maybe more akin to, say, a Meritzen style beer uh, as an amber lager. And so in those days, in the mid 90s, uh, you had to have color in your beer or you had to have fruitiness from ale yeast or you have, had to have a lot of hops to, to garner the attention among customers. So Edel Pills kind of, you know, it, 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 it languished. It was did OK, but never really had the spark. And when we made Spotted Cow, that just took the world by or took the state by storm. And so, so many years have gone by now that the customers have come full circle and are returning back to um, starting to appreciate lager beers of that style. So for our 30th anniversary, we just made, I think we made 200 barrels of it to sell out of the brewery and um, uh, uh, in the town of New Glarus. And um, so we only made a small amount and I think it finally struck a chord that people got it. Oftentimes you have to be in the right place at the right time. Well, you certainly have a knack for that. Well, as we approach the top of the hour and we're almost there and we're going to switch to the Q and a, uh, and just note, get your questions in there. Dan will answer those in just a couple of minutes. Uh, also, you know, if you need to run if this is recorded, the questions will be recorded. Maybe more importantly, you can vote up the most important question. So look over the questions. And if you've got one you really want, vote it up and it'll be answered first because that's the order I take them in is which, one, which ones you want the most. So, Dan, here's, here's my question. Uh, I, like I said, brewers like to uh, vent at me sometimes, which is good because I learn. <laughs> we all so have I, PTSD. Yeah. We're all... <laughs> That's right. Brewing right. business that's, is a tough business. <laughs> I, I was had the privilege of spending about half a day uh, with Scott Jennings at Sierra Nevada in Mills River, North Carolina. We were wandering through. And every time we talked about a different beer, I'd ask him what yeast it was. So the first time he said, is Chico yeast. And I asked about another one, Chico yeast. Well, this pattern repeated through about six or seven different beers. And finally, I asked one more time, and, and Scott said, do you not see that other than the few sure. lagers or Hepaweizen, we do everything, every single thing with Chico yeast? Now, from what I've heard about you, Dan, you 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 look at yeast as the star of the show. I think that's what you said in an er earlier yes. interview. That's correct. So, and, and Stephen... Who's, who's as, as you just mentioned, Belgian brewer, he said, hey, make my life easy. We use the same yeast in almost everything, but you don't. So can you talk about that a little bit more, the importance of having different yeasts? Uh, it's, it really is a double-edged sword because uh, when you're using mostly one yeast, um, it, it, it makes things... Um, a little bit more easy, easier to control because um, yeast is, is your partner. So if you have multiple yeast, it's like trying to be a farmer with multiple animals. So if you're a dairy farmer, you, you know how to take care of dairy cows, but you don't have, uh, maybe you don't have chickens and goats and horses and zebras and whatnot. But if you have lots of animals or lots of yeast, the equipment is different because um a brewery, a cellar. Okay, so a brew house, the design of a brew house is dictated by the type of malt that you're getting. So maybe not in modern craft breweries, but historically over the centuries, a brew house design is dictated by the type of malt that the brewer is using. 
the cellar design is dictated by the yeast. So a brewery, the reason why an Anheuser-Busch brewery looks the, looks the way it does is because it's built to suit the yeast that they use. The reason why, say, an English ale brewery, same thing. So you learn to work with your yeast and keep your yeast happy. If you have more than one yeast, it becomes difficult to, um, it's cumbersome and clunky because, you know, it's a law of engineering that when you ask a machine or anything to do more than one thing, it's a compromise of design. So Sierra Nevada over there, whatever, you know, 35, 40 years of, of life have drilled down how to use this yeast and they're partners with it. And their, their breweries are built to serve that yeast. When they use a different yeast, it's a deviation. And most of us can set our watches to how our yeast performs. But when you add a new yeast into it, you have very, you have difficulties. And until you figure out how to use them, you have things like stuck fermentations and off flavors and yeast that won't flocculate or yeast that flocculates. It takes time to figure it out. So, um, and then there's also a concern for cross-contamination. If you're talking about two ale strains that are very similar, maybe it's not a problem, but a Weiss beer yeast or a Britannomyces yeast with a lager yeast, if you get a cross-contamination, it becomes difficult. So those are the main reasons why people like to stay with one yeast and really drill down and become experts. The problem, the only downside with that, and you can make obviously brilliant beer. So I don't mean to, to, to say that that's not the correct way to make beer, but it, it can ha you can end up with what a, maybe what the Germans would call a Hauschgeschmack or a house flavor in the beer so that all of the beers taste more or less the same and the differences are only about the different malts and different hops that you're using. But the fermentation characteristics are more or less the same. So by using different yeast, you can coax out different flavors. Um, and uh, we, we use on a regular basis, maybe six different yeasts in a year. Our number, we, we make... We make, we use two ale yeasts and one lager yeast pretty much all year round. But then we use a Weiss beer yeast. We use a Belgian style yeast. Um, we do souring fermentation. So we do definitely explore this type of, um, th these, these types of flavors that can be coaxed out. But now after 30 years, these main yeasts, I understand uh, pretty well and know how to use them. And and that took a long time to figure out. And I would say that uh, because of this, I'm a really good microbiologist because it's not it's not that easy. Uh, it adds a whole another layer layer of complexity. But it does mean that our 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 Guza, our lambic style beers, our American sours taste very different than our American style lagers that taste very different than say our dry hopped IPA versus. Um, say, uh, our pale ale, uh, et cetera, they all taste very, very different. And that allows us to have, um, it's a vulnerability, it's expensive, but it allows us to differentiate ourselves in a crowded marketplace because in the end, the brewing business is very, very competitive. And uh, so by, by manipulating our water, by manipulating our hops, our malt and our yeast, we have infinite possibilities. Wow. Well, I enjoyed thoroughly our interview when we were talking to Matthias, and uh, we well, hopefully we can get that out on YouTube before long and let everybody else enjoy it too. So then there's some great details there. But uh, Dan, let's switch over to the questions. Are you you ready for that? Sure. All right. Uh, again, those of you that need to go, this is recorded. Uh, so you can jump back to these. And if you post a question, you should get an email with a link to exactly where your question was answered. Please vote so we can ask the most important questions to you first, because we got a big crowd of people. I think we over, over 2000 registrations, Dan. So you, you know wow. how to have a commanding crowd here. This is great. Thank you everyone for coming. And if you need to go, we understand. So. Let's switch over to the questions. 
All right. George has our most popular question uh, right now. And he wants to discuss the origins of Saz or Froberg. Did I pronounce that right? Anywhere yeah. close to right? Yeah. Lineages. Yeah. Ooh, okay. So these are this is a uh, two categories of lager yeast. This is funny. This is like I'm getting an examination here. Uh, so um, Sazer refers to the town of Jatetz or Saz in the German language in Czech Republic, and Froberg is a, I believe it's a, a brewer was a brewery in uh, called Froberg in uh, in Germany. I think I, if memory serves, it's in the city of. Grimmel. Uh, but in any event, uh, in about 1900, uh, a professor in Lintner noticed that the yeast, that he divided yeast into these two categories. Uh, he noticed that the Sazer yeast was different than the Froberg. They're both lager yeast, but um, the Sazer yeast did not ferment um, uh, maltotriose, so it did not ferment as deeply. And, but it was much more cold tolerant. The Froberg, on the other hand, would ferment um, uh, 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 deeper. So it fermented maltotriose in general, not all strains, but in general, you could say that, and also was less cold tolerant. And so in modern times, uh, this, 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 this category, categorization came about, uh, as I said, in around 1900 or 1906, somewhere in that time period. And modern um, uh, genetics have shown that the Sazer strain has more of the characteristics of the Saccharomyces ubionis, uh, which is a, a not as deep a fermenter, but much more cold tolerant. And the Froberg has uh, less of the, um, the ubionis characteristics. So uh, they're slightly, they, they, they have slightly different amounts of these two, when they hybridize different amounts of these two um, uh, 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 species that made up the, the Saccharomyces uh, pastoriana strain. They're both lager yeast though. And most yeasts are uh, of the Froberg type. 3470 is considered to be, I believe, um, according to my friends at Vice Stefan, it's a Froberg yeast. And most yeasts are Froberg. Froberg strains are preferred because they uh, modern brewers like to, a deeper firm, a higher attenuation, um, lower OG and higher alcohol. Um, and the Sazer strains are less popular there, but they, they are more robust at colder temperatures. And I can't think of any um, Sazer yeast that, uh, that I know of, although certainly they are out there. Wow. <laughs> I always learn a lot when I, when I talk to you, Dan, uh, but George, what a great question. <laughs> that's, that's phenomenal. Well, Dan has a great question coming up. Uh, so here we go. In regards to finding historically domesticated yeast, have you considered doing research on Kvike or Landrace yeast that are still being used by some European farmhouse brewing? These are being recovered by people like Lars Garsol and William Holden. I don't know William Holden. That's an interesting name, Dan. <laughs> uh, I, I have not brewed uh, with uh, with uh, Kvike uh, yeast, uh, um, but uh, I I did sponsor a trip for. Um, the, the crew from Weinstefan, Matthias Hutzler, who we've talked about, to go to on a hunting trip to the country of Georgia. Georgia is really uh, the, I believe, the oldest civilizations that are making wine, or at least one of the oldest that, are, that have continuously made wine. Wine's been made there forever in a very rustic way, and they also make beer. So Matthias uh, and, and crew went there looking for yeast, and he found um he found some interesting uh wild yeast and brought them back and sent us one and uh it is a uh a very fruity tasting um a, maybe a little mini bit of phenols but not too much and i'm thinking about doing something with it i haven't done it yet because you know there's only so many hours in a day but 
eventually we might make some sort of table beer, you know, a, a blonde Belgian style beer that's highly hopped, golden, unfiltered uh, beer with that. But um, that is the main uh, yeast that, uh, that I find of interest uh, as far as uh, historical yeast. Although uh, a couple of weeks ago, a man, uh, I, I've been out of the country for hop selection and then at the master brewers meeting. So I haven't had time to deal with it, but a, a story showed up from a brewery here in Wisconsin that's been out of business for a hundred years and in a cave underneath the brewing site, he found some bottles of beer. So he gave us one of the bottles and uh, I don't know if there's live yeast left in it, but I'm going to send that bottle to, um, to Vine Stefan and have them try to extract and isolate it. If they, maybe they can find live yeast. I, 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 I highly doubt it, but it would be way cool if they could. Um, but if they can't, at least they can, um, uh, 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 try to figure out the genetics on these yeast to understand where it came from. So uh, those are the two uh, kind of wild yeast uh, or crazy yeast things that I'm working on. Well, that sounds like a great story. If, if Matthias had, finds something interesting, I hope you'll let me know because that would be uh, great to talk about. Yeah, yes, it would be. I got my fingers crossed. We'll see. <laughs> We'll see. If, if anybody can do it, I think it's you and Matthias. Go make yeah, a great team. He's a, Matthias is a great microbiologist. He's a guy's a genius. All right. Jacob has our next question. He says, do you have a favorite yeast strain? Who? Boy. Well, you know, um, I, uh, huh. I really like, uh, I, I mean, I, I know this is kind of a white bread answer, but I really like 3470. I like it because I understand it and uh, it produces a really nice beer, but more importantly, because uh, my mentor, uh, Ludwig Narcis, was, was the one that selected it. So it has a special place in my heart. Uh, he was a great guy and a great friend and uh, is, is uh, dearly missed. And it, it's, it's a great yeast strain. Um, we also have a, um, a Weiss beer yeast, uh, that we use. I, I think it's strain 172 from TUM that I really like. We, we use a multiple Weiss beer yeast. We have like three or four of them that we use, but probably my favorite is, I think it's, it's 172. It's either 172 or 177. And the reason I like that is because it's balanced phenols and, um, uh, esters. It's not, it's not over the top esters and it's not over the top, uh, um, phen phenols and esters are in balance and, um, it's definitely a top cropping yeast. So you have to, it's better if you used open fermenters. And, and one thing I like about you, Dan, is I can ask yeast questions and I don't get fussed out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jacob has our next question. Any tips on selective pressures to develop desired characteristics of house lager strains? Ooh, well, if you're talking about flocculation characteristics, that's uh, takes time, but um, that would be um, simply doing a fermentation, say in a cylinder, in a one liter cylinder. If you want, if you want a Flocculent yeast to be a powdery yeast, you would let the yeast settle and then take the, the supernatant, the yeast that's left in suspension and do another fermentation and, and maybe do that 10 times. And as, as long as you can do it in a sterile manner, you will select for a powdery version of that, of that flocculent yeast or the vice, vice versa, like that's what Ludwig Narcis did with 3470. Just uh, uh, collect the, the stuff that settles and do that um, 10 times. As far as trying to select for flavor attributes, um, I think that would be uh, very, very hard. I think that for me personally, I would leave it to say a specialist laboratory, um, somebody like Berkeley or o Omega, uh, I would contact them and ask them for help on that. But uh, certainly if you, um, 
take yeast, I'm thinking out loud here, but streak it onto a plate of a general uh, all-purpose uh, media that will grow yeast. Uh, and uh, you then you have single colonies if you can streak them out. And I think there are probably classes you can take on sterile technique and, uh, you know, extension courses on, on how to do this work. But if you if you had a plate and you you could have single colonies, you could select each colony and uh, grow it up and do a fermentation with these colonies and see what happens. But that would be um, painstaking and um, very random. Uh, so if you're looking for flavor characteristics, I think that would be uh, have to be a real labor of love because it'd be a lot of work. Well, work isn't necessarily a dirty word, but that can be uh, particularly challenging sometimes. Uh, let's see. All right. Let's see. Oh, I, I tried to put this link. I put it in our question. So let everybody know we, we're about done here. We're about to go through our last uh, question. So I'm going to put the after party link there uh that hopefully dan do you think you can have a minute to join us because i think we're sure, going to uh, for a couple of minutes uh okay i gotta i'll have to uh um have to uh bail out but i'll i can stay for a couple of minutes yeah okay well no pressure so jacob has our last question and he wants to talk about the tum 35 characteristics is that something Ooh. you can address uh, I have never used 35, but there is a paper, uh, written on a journal called Brewing Science by Matthias Hutzler, uh, on the strain 35. I have personally never used this yeast. If, oh boy, you guys are asking me questions like I got to dig in the back of my brain and I'm old. Um, it was a recent paper. If memory serves, 35 was a little bit more finicky than 34. And um, but there's a really nice paper in the in the journal called Brewing Science. Or it used to be called Brau Wissenschaft, but it's now called Brewing Science. And I wonder if you can find that online. And it's a very good deep dive into that yeast strain. But I'm. I apologize. I, I I don't know that much about that strain. Wow, Dan. <laughs> but I, but I can't. I can't tell you that it used to be common in the old days for brewers to use multiple yeast strains in their brewery. I think you know back in the day when tanks were small, um, it, and you'd make a brew and put it into a tank. Brewers often had more than one lager strain in their cellar. And then they would blend, they'd separate, they do separate primary fermentation, harvest the yeast, keep it separate, and then blend the beer to a lager tank. And the idea with that was that you could take a powdery strain and a um, flocculent strain and then have a proper secondary fermentation. So it was much easier uh, in a multiple, in a two tank process. But now that we have big tanks, it's, it's a little bit too cumbersome getting back to our discussion about having more than one yeast strains, but there are still breweries in Munich. There's still w one well-known brewery and I won't mention which one that uses more than one yeast strain. So, uh, you know, you certainly could try 35 and 34, uh, and side by side and then blend them together and see what you get. Uh, normally it's, it's something that's been lost in the modern brewing world, but in the old days, it used to be beer was probably better uh, back before the modern ways of brewing when things were a little bit more complex. Well, you know, I've heard just the opposite, though, that people said years ago it was not that good. But maybe we're uh, going recent uh, memory versus beyond you know, uh, 150 you're, years ago. You're, you're, Doug, your point is, is valid. Uh, it's a, it's a, it goes both ways the 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 beer was probably a good beer it was probably more complex it was probably more variable but we've lost complexity uh with the simplicity of design but one of my first teachers was walter swistowitz at the siebel institute and he started brewing as an apprentice at the end of prohibition 
And in those days, there were breweries in all of the small towns in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, and New York, and said, you know, all over. And I said to him, I, I said, Swiss, in those days when you were 16 and starting out as a brewer, did all of these little breweries make good beer? He said, no, most of them made really bad beer. And the reason why people like Coors and Miller and Anheuser-Busch survived is because they made better beer. So on one hand, you are correct. But my point is, is that we've lost some complexity uh, through this homogenization of process. Well, and I remember in our, oh my gosh, thought I had, thought I'd mastered it. <laughs> I really God has I'm a getting sense of overconfident. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you saying that you were equating it to tomatoes and that you felt like that the tomatoes of the past <laughs> yeah. were likely far more delicious yes. than the ones currently, even though they can be produced in large volumes. And well, I am a uh, I'm a I'm a product of UC Davis, and UC Davis was where they invented the tomatoes that are basically like hardballs because you can ship them all over the country and they stay beautiful, but they don't taste like much. And uh, certainly the tomatoes you get in the farmer's market are better, but they don't last very long. So um, maybe, maybe there was a lot of bad beer in the old days, but when beer was good, it was probably really brilliant. Well, your insights are fantastic. Uh, can't wait to have some of your beers. And thank you for doing this, Dan, for previous interviews, this one. And you, you really, I think what I had heard at GABF, when I said you were going to be on the program, they said, well, I stop and I listen to Dan Carey. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. So uh, with that, I think we can uh, wrap this up. I want to give a cheers to you. Thank you for doing this. Cheers. Cheers. And then we're going to switch over to the uh, Zoom. I put the link there there for everybody. Might be a moment before we get on there, but click on the link that I put in there in the chat. It says bit.ly for me, uh, forward uh, gourmet hangout. And uh, we'll see you there. And, and Dan, you said you might join us for a minute. Yep. Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll click on it right now. So I'm going to, I'll disappear. Okay. No pressure. Thank you. All Thank right. you, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Doug.